I'm Mariana Vieira. And I'm Amrit Swali. And you're listening to Undercurrents, the podcast from Chatham House. Hello and welcome to another episode of Undercurrents. Today we have ditched Ben Horton and Mariana and I have decided to take over Undercurrents. Mariana, how are you? I'm good, Amrit. I think it's my second takeover since I started as a co-host. Ah, so you're the key instigator of the podcast coup. It's all my fault. Um, <laughs> but no, I must admit I'm still recovering from going into the office yesterday. I was told it would be very busy. Apparently Thursdays are the busiest days in the Institute. But it was still really overwhelming. I still felt very unprepared. And I must say that you were sorely missed. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. It's been a busy week. I'm definitely looking forward to the weekend. You have a really cool interview this week, Mariana. Who did you speak to? I do. So I spoke with uh, Hamid Hakimi, who is a research associate with the Asia Pacific Program and the Europe Program at Chatham House. He's also currently pursuing a PhD at the University of Cambridge, and he has written quite a few articles for the World Today magazine throughout the years on a number of different occasions, and most recently for our current issue, looking at the consequences of the U.S. troop withdrawal for the Afghan population. We spoke about the timing of the U.S. decision to pull out of Afghanistan, and then we discussed this in light of the larger trends in Western attitudes toward the region. We then touched upon Hamid's research into migration policies and language, as well as how Afghanistan has changed in the last 20 years since the outbreak of the conflict. How about you, Amrit? Who did you speak to? I spoke to John Keane, who is Professor of Politics at the University of Sydney, and Debussy Shroy Chowdhury, who is a journalist based in Hong Kong. Deb and Roy are the authors of To Kill a Democracy, India's Passage to Despotism, which is a new book released just a couple of weeks ago. It's a very provocative title, but it's a very overarching and important book. We'll hear more about it in the interview, but the book essentially looks to unpack the narrative of India being the world's largest democracy, eventually concluding that it is actually the world's largest failing democracy. Let's have a listen. So now I'm joined by Hamid Hakimi. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's wonderful. So I thought we would jump right into it and talk about how Afghanistan has resurfaced in the minds of Western policymakers most recently in the context of the U.S. troop withdrawal announcement. This is taking place 20 years after the launch of the first phase of the war in Afghanistan. And why do you think the U.S. is withdrawing now as opposed to earlier in the conflict or later down the line? As far as the conflict in Afghanistan is concerned, it's been quite intense for the Afghans ever since 2001 and even before that, because the conflict in Afghanistan actually began over four decades ago, beginning with a coup d'etat of the Communist Party in 1978 that overthrew the so-called First Republic government of Afghanistan and then followed by the Soviet invasion. But kind of jumping back to the post-2001 period, the question of the Americans leaving and NATO withdrawing with them. This was very much on the agenda when President Obama, he won the elections in 2008, 2009, he came to power, and immediately his uh, priority was to conclude the war in Afghanistan. And in 2014, uh, the bulk majority of the US troops, along with NATO countries' uh, troops, did leave Afghanistan. Uh, So very much since 2014, there has been a military transition in Afghanistan, handing over the majority of the day-to-day battle against the Taliban and ISIS and others over to the security forces of Afghanistan. So as far as the domestic picture is concerned, there was a military transition in 2014 that pretty much began in 2012 with the donor conference in Tokyo. So the withdrawal has happened over time. But having said all of that, I think The expectation was that with President Trump's agreement with the Taliban in Doha in February 2020, that with the Biden administration, there would be a slightly sort of rethink because at least as far as the Afghan government and certain sort of non-Taliban perspectives are concerned, the view was that the Americans would take stock of the fact that the Taliban haven't really reduced the level of violence, that they are really attacking, especially districts and 
the violence is really high. The violence hasn't gone down. And that would initiate thinking in Washington under President Biden to slow down or rethink deal that President Trump, his administration had signed with the Taliban. But, you know, what President Biden did in April this year was totally unexpected because he announced an unconditional withdrawal of all US troops. So, so to that extent, the unconditionality feels quite sudden. But is this the only withdrawal that's happened? No, this is actually kind of last symbolic withdrawal. This bulk of withdrawal happened almost a decade ago. I was reading up on this article that you wrote for the World Today magazine last spring, where you mentioned that Western attitudes to Afghanistan have followed an odd trajectory. Maybe you could explain a bit more what you meant by this and also how the U.S. troop withdrawal fits in this bigger picture of the Western agenda. What I meant was, I mean, this is a question I'm really grappling with for a long time. You know, I'm always asked as somebody who's researching Afghanistan works on, on the region, how do you make sense of this whole thing? You know, and for me, it's uh, it's really a story of a lack of coordination among the international players. You know, there are a few themes that come up. One is the lack of coordination in the whole intervention that went ahead. So it wasn't surprising to see the Australians doing something in southwestern Afghanistan, the Brits doing something completely different in the southern parts, the Americans doing something elsewhere. The Germans doing something up north in the country and all of these interventions, and I'm here, I'm not talking military, I'm talking humanitarian and developmental interventions. They did not necessarily coordinate with each other. So there was a lot of replicating the same thing. And it was just very emblematic of the Afghans themselves having quite limited agency. And that's what I meant in the piece when I talked about the lack of a coherent trajectory, because Famously, President George W. Bush in October 2001, he announced the military invasion. He said that the Taliban will be punished and that the Afghan people will appreciate the hospitality of the international community. So it was this very triumphalist approach to the war in Afghanistan that they're coming, saving this several tens of millions, whatever the population was, from this very savage group of people who had hosted the Al-Qaeda and then it went into sort of this narrative about building the state and women's rights and all of that. But slowly, it then shifted into a thing about, you know, the donor fatigues, as it's called. And then everyone was talking like, you know, where's this money going? Why is Afghanistan not changing quickly? And, and at the end, it came to this other thing in Obama years about what was called the mutually hurting stalemate, military stalemate, and all of this, while tens of thousands of Afghans were killed and injured. That language was very much void of Afghan agency. And uh, I went to Afghanistan several times in those years, and it was very interesting because I would go and meet civil society Afghan organizations and activists who would be literally on the front line trying to do things and then go see people in the military or, and diplomatic side on the Western embassy side. And they would talk in this language that would be completely divorced of those bunkers that they were in and those concrete walls that they were inside. So that odd trajectory is very much the story of what the Western world saw in the conflict and how they de defined it. And to the point that now um, President Biden famously, when he was candidate Biden recently, he said that, you know, he alluded to Afghanistan basically not being a country properly, that they haven't really got on very well. I mean, I wrote about this last year in April. And, and the language was very much about, you know, Afghans need to sort this themselves, all of this. And some Afghans actually that I speak to tell me, they say, you know, it's very rich of the Western countries to come with 42 countries, whatever, and hundreds of thousands of troops disrupt or, or intervene and then just pull out. You know, this is what in that piece that I wrote, I talked about pulling the dagger. That wasn't me. That was an Afghan elderly man talking about his country's military invasion, intervention, whatever you call it. He saw that as an invasion and he said the American invasion was a dagger and that when you pull it out, that's where you need to be more careful because the pulling out of the dagger kills you more often than, than the stabbing itself. So kind of very, you know, for those of us who've been very immersed in work on Afghanistan, this is something that we all see. So it's not something that I hold in some kind of a, an individual opinion, but, you know, it's very much shared by people who know Afghanistan have worked in it or have spoken to Afghans. That's fascinating. Bringing up this point that you made about the shifting discourses that are sort of detached from reality, I wondered if we could focus a bit more on the research that you do on migration for Chatham House. 
there's been an increasing use of this crisis management language that portrays migration as a threat for the West to tackle. At what cost does this obscure other dynamics of migration as a social phenomenon, especially in the case of Afghanistan? So for Chatham House, I've been involved in migration research for the last sort of five, six years. And what I have been very interested to look at is starting with the drivers of migration. This was the height of what was called in Europe the um, migration crisis, which then ever since has been called by academics and researchers as a crisis of migration management in Europe. It wasn't necessarily the sheer numbers, uh, which were considerably larger, of course, in 2014-15, spiked by the Syrian conflict as well that displaced millions of Syrians, unfortunately. But for Afghans, uh, this is one of Afghanistan is one of the world's uh, longest and protracted refugee source countries. As I mentioned at the beginning, you know, this began in the 70s, very early 80s, when the Soviet invasion took place. But in, in the large numbers that have moved out of Afghanistan, the outward migration from Afghanistan, this has happened to mainly neighboring countries uh, of Pakistan and Iran. Collectively, the numbers are somewhere between 4.5 to 5 million Afghans who are outside Afghanistan and the bulk majority. Over 4 million of this is considered to be in Iran and Pakistan. And, and here, I must say that these numbers are very much uh, based on estimates. And I mean, although they're quoted by the World Bank and the development agencies, but I mean, these are all estimates. So for Afghanistan as a country, it's very much impacted by the experience of nation states emerging in around post-colonial period and colonial period. And so the geography that we today see as Afghanistan is at the center of, you know, this kind of a roundabout region where it connects to South Asia on the what used to be British India, India, Greater India, that now today is Pakistan and India. So it borders Pakistan, it borders Central Asia, and it borders Iran, which is considered sort of Middle East, West Asia. So this is a, a country that is at the joining of several regions, and all these regions were you know, in the kind of pre-colonial period, considered to be places of mobilities and connectivities and connections. So the historical Silk Route that we talk about, the Gandahar of civilization that we talk about. This is from Zoroastrian times, you know. This place is a place of continual mobilities. So even in the modern sense, uh, the, the displacement and migration in Afghanistan is very much a survival uh, mechanism in the last uh, several decades because of conflict. And particularly since the sort of 1992-96 civil war that, that happened before the Taliban, it started a new kind of migration where Afghans started to arrive in Europe, mainly to the United States as well, Canada, Australia. And these were migrations that took place in a way that these individuals left without having the intention to return. Whereas previously in Iran and Pakistan, the millions of Afghans who've lived they have never been granted the kind of permanent refugee status or any kind of paths to citizenship, for instance. So there's all of this precarity that they would be returned by force or that the emotional attachment to those countries hasn't happened in a way that, for example, the migration to Europe manifests. So for, for Afghans, the migration pathway and the migration trajectories have been very much, especially in the last few decades, a thing about survival, it's not seen as kind of unnatural, and they don't just do it. This is kind of done pragmatically with a lot of thinking, and this language of this being a crisis and people just running without thinking, you know, that they're going where they're going. It's kind of like you know this narrative that somehow these people are just turning up the border at the borders without really giving it a lot of thought. I think that's wrong, and you know, in most cases, people leave their home and the decision to leave and say bye to your family is very profoundly painful. And in most cases, people who leave, they actually, you know, and this is based on my interviews and, you know, even personal experiences, that there is a belief that maybe you would never see your family again. So the idea that this was somehow, you know, in light of the attractive environment that Europe provided, I mean, it was not so much about that as it was about the push factors, about the survival mechanism that really uh, drives migration in places like Afghanistan. To this point that you made on the importance or the relevance of the geographic location of Afghanistan as this joining of regions, this reminded me of how in the current issue of the World Today magazine, you assessed the effects of the West troop role 
And you paid special attention to this point on how it might lead to an intensification of the proxy war in Afghanistan by the countries in the region. So to what extent is the military competition amongst its neighbors reflective of Afghanistan's strategic importance for regional connectivity? So because of the conflict in Afghanistan, the sort of the 1970s and 80s in particular, when the Soviet invasion happened, the United States and other Western countries at the time who were the, uh, the anti-Soviet bloc, they listed the help of Pakistan mainly, but also later on, Iran got involved too. But mainly it was Pakistan that facilitated the help and the funding from the CIA and other Western allied nations to allow millions of Afghans and come to seek refuge in Pakistan to be regrouped and recruited as what was called the Mujahideen groups. And they were what is called Panzim, so these are jihadi organizations. Uh, they were formed, there were seven of them, and there were two or three who were incredibly uh, extremist, and they were favored by the Pakistani intelligence service, and the money from the CIA really helped to take those organizations forward in Afghanistan militarily. And they were involved in what was then, you know, the civil war of the 1992-96 period. So that's kind of a very brief historical narrative. So the, the proxy client relationship between the regional countries and the various armed factions in Afghanistan go back to the 70s and the 80s, definitely. And those relationships have stayed. And it also, you know, extended into the Taliban period, because the Taliban genealogy also go to the Mujahideen groups of the 80s. So the Taliban had an extended relationship with uh, Pakistan as being the Pakistani, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia were the only three countries that recognized the Taliban diplomatically at the time. And Pakistan had an embassy in Kabul, it had a consulate in Jalalabad, it had a, in the eastern and also in the south, they had a consulate. And, you know, if you wanted to go to Afghanistan in the Taliban period, you know, the only route would have been through Pakistan. So Pakistan was the gatekeeping country when the Taliban were in power. And then when the American invasion of 2001, the military intervention happened, you know, a lot of these, these Taliban ran away to Pakistan and they found refuge there, their families are there. I mean, only this week, the Pakistani interior minister admitted in a, in a media interview that the, the Pakistan hosts Taliban's uh, families and their leadership. So the, the problem with the proxy situation is that it is very much a war between India and Pakistan, between Iran and the West, the Chinese and the Russians, and everybody else who are around Afghanistan. Uh, they have means to uh, mobilize their proxy, Afghan proxy, elements in the country to engage in contestations that are usually armed and, and result in fighting and violence uh, to promote those countries and those countries' um, wider interests through Afghanistan. And here, mainly the concern is that, you know, Pakistan and Iran as being the two bigger neighbors with much bigger engagement and involvement, that they have the capacity to, to affect the, the situation and that through their proxy and sort of these armed groups and various other factions in Afghanistan that they have connections with, that they'd be able to get into kind of renewed violence that really is about the interests of those countries, but it's uh, manifesting on the ground in Afghanistan. Thank you so much, Hamid. That's such an in-depth picture of the original connectivity aspect that you also talk about in other parts of your research. I thought that as a final question, I would like to move away from this US-centric lenses on Afghanistan that sees the country as a sort of static backdrop for hostilities. I mean, no doubt that the country has changed over the last 20 years and the Afghan population has become significantly younger with 47% being under 15 years old as of last year. Going forward, what are the implications of these changing demographics for society, for national policymakers, and even international aid donors? That's a wonderful question, and it's important to address the changes in Afghanistan. And we have to also step away from this kind of, you know, uh, Western-centric mantras, such as the gains of the last 20 years. And by that, we usually mean stuff that we can understand and relate to. But Afghanistan is a fundamentally transformed place. As you rightly pointed out, it's a significantly younger demographic, which offers both opportunities because this demographic has ambitions. It wants to, in general sense, 
be economically active. The economic aspirations have really hardened. Uh, so this Afghanistan, this place where ideologies are born and then majority of the society rallies around those ideologies, I think that can be challenged, especially if we look at the uh, urban populations, uh, urban youth bulge. But it also offers challenges because, you know, unless there is stability in Afghanistan, that this urban young population, like other parts of the world where you have youth bulge in the urban sense, uh, you know, they will be forced to leave the country to seek their aspirations elsewhere or to be involved in the illicit economy of uh, drugs or all the kinds of challenges that societies with weak states are faced with. But I'm always heartened. I, I feel very encouraged every single time I am in Afghanistan and I, and I feel a bit down and I just go out and I see the younger people. I, I go into cafes in the cities or I, I meet a tailor. I, I know somebody who, for example, sews a waistcoat or something like that, very completely human and non-political. You know, that's where you see the rays of hope. That's where you see the, the change that's really happened. But for that, we need to be aware of the fact that when you have, we have to remove our Western lenses, we have to see people and speak to them, even if we disagree with their lifestyles, even if we disagree with the way they're dressed. And this applies to very much everywhere in the world. Uh, in places like Afghanistan, it really does apply because the, the aspirations are there. We have um, a responsibility, I think, to tell the story correctly. Uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that in our analysis, uh, we use the methodologies correctly that captures this kind of aspirational changed country that is changed from their perspective, it's their agency, it's their story, it's their aspirations, and that we're not tainting them with this kind of, you know, Western political agenda of the states that keep shifting. You know, you can go back to uh, sort of the Americans, you know, they have an agency called the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction that looks at the money that's been spent by American taxpayer. And we had the head of that entity at Chatham House a couple of years ago. You know, it's a congressional entity. And he said to us in Chatham House that America had fought not a single war of several years, but an annual war in several years. So every year he saw the American and Western objectives in Afghanistan shifting. And, and that puts a huge amount of pressure on on the local agency of the Afghans, and especially those Afghans who believe in the kind of cosmopolitanism that they aspire to, to have and the kind of globalization that's happened around them and they're aware of either through their mobile phone screens or their travels or meeting with people from outside world or themselves traveling. So there is a lot of hope, but I think for that hope to emerge, we really need the smoke screen of violence to go down. And we really need to remove our Western lenses to see the deeper picture. I think on that uh, rather encouraging and hopeful note, I'll end the, my questions here. Thank you so much, Hamid, for joining us once again. Thank you for having me. It was a wonderful chat. Today I'm joined by the authors of a new book called To Kill a Democracy, India's Passage to Despotism. John Keane and Devasi Roy Chowdhury, thank you so much for joining me today. I wanted to start with a fairly straightforward question. Could you tell us what your book is about and why did you want to write it now? What is it about India's current political and social state that makes your book particularly relevant? Well, Amrit, it's a um, great pleasure to be with you and with Devasish. This book is an attempt to write differently about India. It offers a reappraisal of India's politics and society. It is a questioning of uh, what we call the India story. The India story has it that India is the world's largest democracy. Actually, what we show in this book is that India is better understood as the world's largest endangered democracy. It's a book that offers readers an understanding of the different meanings of democracy. We remind readers that democracy is more than elections, pressing a button or ticking a box, that it has the whole idea of democracy is that it's a way of life among equals. We do uh, have 
lots of things to say in this book about how democracies perish. And finally, we try to show why it is that India is of global relevance, that people elsewhere should pay attention to what's going on in India and actually should fear what's going on. What I would like to add to John is, of course, as the title suggests, the book is about uh, the crisis of democracy in what is considered the world's biggest democracy. And as you know that India has been falling steadily in global democracy ratings. Sweden's VDEM now classifies India as an electoral autocracy, while Freedom House puts it in the least free category. So oh, these current anxieties about India's democratic decline are, of course, linked to Narendra Modi's rise to power, especially since he was re-elected in 2019, which has seen widespread attacks on civil liberties and the capture of governing institutions at a scale that hasn't been seen before. But actually, we show in the book that the rot runs a lot deeper and that Indian democracy wasn't doing all that great even before Modi showed up and its democratic institutions have for a long time been gradually eroded, while the social foundations on which democracy rests has been crumbling. And international democracy trackers mainly concern themselves with institutional decay. But uh, if we look at the COVID catastrophe, for example, we see the extent of the damage to India's social foundations that has taken place over the last few decades. So these are some of the things that we uh, have highlighted in the book and which we think are important in any analysis of democracy. One of the things I found most engaging about the book was the way you used personal stories to drive the narrative and really illustrate the points you were trying to make. How was this research conducted and why did you decide to adopt this approach? So the book is a mix of field work, data gathering and study of media reports and academic work on India. As a journalist, I have always felt that uh, academic books could be more relatable if they include personal stories, you know, like put a face to the problem as we do in journalistic writings. In John, who is an acclaimed political theorist, I found a surprisingly willing partner to do this and and we took it from there. Yes, this book is, as Deb says, an experiment in writing, a joint effort of a journalist, and a professor. And yes, it involves a rich tapestry of thoughts and and ideas. I would add to what Deb had to say that we try to write this book about democracy democratically, by which I mean that this is a book that is something like an open text It contains different perspectives. It enables readers to make up their own minds about contemporary Indian politics and society, past and and present. It contains a whole cast of characters. This is Gandhi, Didi Banerjee, Mamata Banerjee. It includes um, material on uh, Yogi Adityanath, the Dalit co-writer of the Constitution, B.R. Ambedkar appears. There are characters like Periyar Ramasamy, the Tamil founder of the self-respect movement, who may not be so well known to outside readers. Goons and gangsters appear. Political operators like uh, DKS appear. There are individuals, fragile individuals, who have stories to tell that we have tried to make space for. And of course, the book is an attempt to give readers a chance to think about the different ideas about democracy, what democracy means. And above all, I would say that this is a democratic book in the sense that we don't moralize. We do have a big story to tell about the contemporary crisis of Indian democracy, but we don't set the bar too high. We try to take our cue from the constitution and from the founding ideals of the independent republic of India. So this is a book with many sides, many faces uh, to it. And we, we think that readers will find it neither dry nor preachy. So from my reading of the book, it 
quite clear that governmental mismanagement done in the interests of economic growth and wealth and the accumulation of power, it's perpetuated existing problems or issues without really offering any solutions to them. And throughout all of these personal stories that you use to demonstrate this, the centrality of social infrastructure is really clear and heavily emphasised. John, I was wondering, do you, could you tell us a bit about what academic literature tells us about the importance of infrastructure in connecting people to democracy and what makes India stand out in this case? Yes, the stories told in our book point to an older, but we think highly relevant understanding of what democracy is. You know, there is a, a habit among journalists and and politicians and other observers to think of democracy as not much more than elections, periodic elections, which should be free and fair. What we say in this book is that democracy is actually much more than casting votes uh, periodically. It's much more than uh, public scrutiny of power, for example, through bodies like the election commission. What we try to explain with lots of examples and characters is that democracy is a special kind of uh, social life. It is freedom from hunger, freedom from humiliation and violence. Democracy is on bad terms with callous employers. Democracy rejects caste bigotry and religious dogmatism. Democracy is about respect for children and women. Uh, Democracy is also about the right to clean air and water. It is freedom from fear. It's a rejection of the dogma that social life can't be changed, that things are naturally as they are given, that subjects have to put up with these things. And This whole idea of the social dimensions of democracy, we think, have been neglected in so much of the scholarly literature, but have also been neglected in practice in the Indian case. And here, we were inspired by the approach of Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize winning, wonderful Indian economist, who many decades ago pioneered what he called the capabilities approach. You know, the idea is that a good political order is one, a democracy certainly is one in which there is a maximization of people's daily access and their equal access to freedoms that enable them to achieve well-being. That's a point of principle that runs through our book. And for this reason, this emphasis on the social foundations of democracy that are needed for any democracy to flourish. It's for this reason that the book is a warning. Anwar Ibrahim, who is a leading politician in Malaysia, has commented already on our book saying that other democracies should pay attention to India because of the dangers that social inequality and social injustice and social fragmentation pose to the very ideals and the institutions of democracy. That point runs deeply through our book. I would like to add that uh, social contract, uh, as it obtains in India, is in the main listed under what is called the directive principles of state policy in the constitution. So directive principles of state policy is different from fundamental rights in that The directive principles are a set of governing guidelines and they are not enforceable in courts of law. So basically, which means that if the state does not provide the welfares listed under the directive principles, then you cannot take the state to court. So I think this has played an important part in the formation, in the degradation of the social foundations that we see in India today. Unlike in the Atlantic and the East Asia regions, the Indian welfare state exists largely as a fine promise in the directive principles of state policy. And like some of these directive principles have uh, only recently migrated to fundamental rights, such as uh, the right to education, which became a fundamental right only in 2009. Uh, So this is probably one of the reasons why we have weak social contract 
in Indian democracy. So I guess, John, you've already mentioned this and Deb, you've touched upon it too, but of the Indian elections are quite infamous. You have stories of voters traveling miles to be able to vote. The elections often see huge turnouts. And of course, the ink stained fingers are globally recognized images. And of course, this creates a very sensationalized view of what democracy means to Indians. But Debbie, you were just talking about this as well, this idea of a social contract. Does this actually exist in India? And how do ordinary Indians understand it? Perhaps there are two parts, if I may, to this question. One is the widespread official story that we call the India story that is told in diplomatic circles among politicians in India and and outside. This India story, as we refer to it in the book, is the story that India is the world's largest uh, democracy. It is the story that fuels, for example, some of the spirit of the attempts to build a quad, uh, Japan, the United States, India, and Australia. And what we do in the book is actually treat this story with care because it is a story that is repeated inside India and and beyond, and it has a definite bite to it. How come this India story, which we are challenging, took root? There are, we say, several reasons. One of them is that there were important achievements in matters of government and law and politics in independent India. I think this narrative that you guys have painted, it's obviously very well reflected in your choice of title, I think, which again, I'm, I imagine was very deliberate. But from my, from my undergraduate understanding, the term despotism is quite touchy. It's controversial, it's very specific, and in some instances, it also imbued with imperial or perhaps oriental undertones. Can I ask why you chose it and why you would describe India under the premiership of Narendra Modi as despotic? What we have seen under Modi is uh, lately unprecedented curbs on personal freedom, you know, such as the freedom of expression. We have seen um, centralization of power, blatantly partisan use of government bodies to attack the ruling party's political and ideological opponents. We have seen criminalization of peaceful dissent in a way that has never been seen before, at least not in the last few decades. Then we have seen the free paths given to vigilante groups to intimidate opponents, or the neutering of the legislature, unprecedented media controls, elite capture of institutions. Then there is this torrent of dark money flooding the political system as a result of electoral bonds which allow anonymous and limitless contributions to political parties. More than 90-95% of uh, these money coming from electoral bonds now goes to fund Modi's party. So the elections are neither free nor fair. Of course, some of these pathologies are not entirely new, but we are seeing an intensification of these pathologies under Modi. But most importantly, or the current concentration of power by a demagogue at the head of a legislatively unchallenged party to push a majoritarian ideology that is in open conflict with the country's uh, constitutional norms of secular multicultural democracy. These are the things that heighten the real dangers of a despotic transition uh, passage, if you will, as never before. So this is why we chose this particular time to highlight what the problems facing Indian democracy. I'd like to add a few words about the genealogy of this keyword despotism. Amrit, you are right. It had a long history uh, before our times, stretching actually back to the Greek world. And there was a certain point in the early modern European period where despotism was a word to describe forms of government in the East, in the subcontinent, in China, in Persia, in Japan. In our book, we emphasize that we're not using the word in that old fashioned sense, but instead, when we speak about despotism as a problem for democracy, we are speaking about a 21st century type of rule, top-down rule, 
where those who rule do so in the name of the people. They present themselves as avatars of the people, a form of top-down rule in which independent judiciary is neutered, in which parliaments are constrained, where the bureaucracy is politicized, where media is clamped down upon and there's lots of propaganda and lies told, and a form of, of rule which, however, is attractive to millions of people and a form of rule that claims to be ruled by the people. Well, this idea of despotism as a kind of rule that manages to produce a, a sort of phantom democracy is not just a textbook possibility. It's what you will find going on in Putin's Russia you will find it in Xi Jinping's China. You will find it in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Turkey, and in Hungary. And one of the lessons that we point out in this book is that democracies can morph or be morphed into a despotism, and that that can happen quite quickly. In Hungary, for example, in Orban,